All right, welcome back to some more physics lectures. Today's topics are going to be nuclear and quantum physics. So the last lecture uh, we got into the sort of basic ideas or what led to uh, kind of this revolution that became about in the early 20th century that we now understand as quantum physics, uh, sometimes it's just called quantum mechanics, quantum, all that quantum stuff. And so we're gonna talk some more about that and then get a little bit into some nuclear physics, though with just like with a lot of other topics we've gone through, we're really only gonna to get to skim the surface. So kind of just throw out some ideas for you and that'll have to be about it for now. Okay, so let's just recap real quick our lessons from the photon. Right? So from that the light quantum lecture, we basically found that photons can act like particles or they can act like waves. They do both. And that brought about this whole idea of that wave-particle duality and just having to kind of accept that things that seem contradictory are actually not contradictory in the end, they're complementary. They actually uh, can work together. And secondly, I kind of threw this out at the end, or maybe quickly at the end of the last lecture, about how thinking about where a photon, in, photon is in any given time and where it's going to land at any given time kind of leads us to the idea that the universe operates fundamentally uh, on probabilities. It's not a deterministic sort of uh, picture. You don't go, go, you don't just go one step to the next step and say, oh, this is how we got from exactly from here to here to here. This is exactly what's going to happen afterwards. We can say very well in most cases, or a lot of cases, what will happen because the probability is incredibly high that it will happen. But when it comes to the world of the very, very small, sometimes we call it the quantum world or subatomic world, um, things are inherently probabilistic and so you can't determine beforehand what actually will be the outcome of any given uh, circumstance. Okay, so the last lecture and the last few lectures were all about light, and it is it was light that really led people to understand the nature of these this quantum world and how it varies very or it's very different than how we usually interact with on our sort of normal scales like human scales. Um, also, would call that kind of more normal interaction is oftentimes in physics now called uh, classical because it relates to sort of pre-era uh, classic sort of period of physics. So as it turns out, it's not just photons that behave as particles and waves or can act as either one. Um, around, or I think in 1924, the sky, uh, De Broglie, De Broglie, I don't know how to say his name exactly, um, but he essentially proposed that all matter and all particles, all subatomic stuff, all the things that make up the universe actually have this wave-particle duality as well. They all act, can act like particles and they can all act like waves. It's not just photons. And so it's electrons, protons, neutrons, uh, other things we haven't talked about, uh, muons, neutrinos, quarks, gluons, there are all kinds of stuff at the subatomic level that we're not really going to be able to get into. But they all have this property where they can either act like a particle or act like a wave. And most of those things were essentially thought of, beforehand were essentially thought of as being particles. Electrons, protons, they were all basically understood as being like billiard balls. Things that were just like flying around, knocking into other things. What that I or what De Broglie kind of gave us was that, well, they can also act like waves, meaning that they also have a wavelength associated with them, they have a frequency associated with them, they have things, they can form interference patterns with other particles like them, because that's all the things that waves do. 
And as it turned out, it only took a few years until uh, experiments were designed and uh, conducted to basically prove him correct, that he was right. That if you perform essentially like the double slit experiment we went through with photons, if you perform essentially the same experiment with electrons, you see the same pattern, or you see the same result, which is an interference pattern. Right? So that was essentially that electrons are traveling like waves as they go through that double slit experiment, just like the photons do. And then furthermore, you know, more and more experiments were done to kind of look at this sort of idea and whether or not it was true, and it's just continually proven to be true. Everything acts at a, on the quantum scale, the subatomic scale, everything acts as a particle and it acts as a wave. It just depends on sort of how you look at it and what the circumstances are. So this uh, term matter wave uh, is used just to indicate essentially that all matter things, and remember matter is a term that means something that has mass. So I could say it has a kilogram or a gram or uh, yeah, something that has mass, uh, that's matter. But all matter actually acts like waves, just as photons do. And the pictures here are actually uh, sort of microscopic images, actually using a special kind of uh, microscope, an electro electron scanning microscope, I believe. But what they are is basically a rings or different shapes of atoms maybe like uh, iron atoms, so all the kind of fenced areas, like the different geometric shapes, those are larger subatomic entities, like an iron atom, say. And uh, researchers are able to actually put them on a surface in a particular pattern, like a triangle or a square or a circle. And what ends up happening is the electrons that are on that surface, it's usually a metallic surface, so there's kind of electrons that are free to move around the surface. When you uh, place all of these atoms around and kind of make this corral, what you get in the middle are these waves, these standing waves, and those waves are the electrons that are corralled in the center and they're interfering with each other to form these standing waves. So this, these pictures are essentially pictures of electrons acting as waves. Okay, so that brings us to well, essentially the question of how best to describe these matter waves. Um, if all of these things at the subatomic scale are acting like particles, or acting like waves, we need a, a way to describe them. And it actually was this guy Schrodinger who formulated an equation, which was essentially what we call a wave equation. but it's a wave equation to describe matter waves. And we don't look at a whole lot of equations in this course, but it's such a famous equation that I figured you, maybe you should see it. And essentially what it's, this version of the equation, there are a number of different versions or ways to write it essentially. Essentially this is saying that on one side, the energy that a matter wave has is equal or can tell you how it is gonna evolve in time right side, that's sort of how it evolves in time. So you don't really have to understand any of the things that go into that, but it's nice to actually at least see it at some point. The important thing here is this idea of a quantity that, or a thing that we can use that essentially stands for, say, an electron, or uh, you know any kind of subatomic particle. That thing needs to have uh, well, if we want to be able to make predictions about what's, what it's going to do, or, yeah, basically make predictions and to see if our actually our predictions are true, then we need to have a thing that's going to describe that. And that thing in the Schrodinger equation is known as the wave function. So, psi, that uh, little like tri uh, trident looking thing, is a Greek letter, psi, but in this case, it is the, the letter, the symbol we use for the wave function. Right? So the wave function is that thing that essentially stands for the electron or the atom 
or it can actually, it doesn't have to be just a single subatomic thing, it can be a collection of subatomic things, but it's like the thing that's actually, we're actually doing the description, or doing the description of, say, the electron. And what it can tell you about it is basically what is possible for, again, say an electron, what's possible for an electron to do in a given scenario, and how probable or how possible is it for you to find it doing any of those things. So a lot of confusing or maybe sort of uh, abstract ideas there. Um, a decent analogy, though not a perfect analogy, is to imagine the wave function of a poker game would essentially tell you or describe all the different hands that are possible in a poker game and how possible it is that you're going to be dealt that any of those hands at a given time. So it's a, it's a very abstract idea, but the thing that it is, it, it, it's just what is able to describe subatomic entities. Okay, so one area where the kind of evolution of this idea of um, matter and photons and all different stuff as being either like a wave or like a particle and then like both and then like either, uh, one of the ways, places where that evolution really played out was in understanding uh, the atomic spectra of different elements. And so the atomic spectra is essentially just the light that the that different elements will give off after you've sort of energized them in a way. Like you pump a bunch of energy into them and then they start to give off uh, light as photons. And if they were giving off, you know, a whole wide spectrum of light, like the whole visible spectrum, then essentially we'd get, you know, you'd, you'd energize the element and then a uh, full like white light would come off and that white light would be made up of all these different kinds of things. Right? Full spectrum of visible light. Turns out that's not the case, or that almost is never the case for any particular element. So instead what happens is, again, you have to kind of give a bunch of energy to that element and usually the elements are in a gas form of some kind. So in this picture here, it's sort of like a, like a neon gas tube, or uh, doesn't have to be neon. In the picture, it's actually hydrogen. But you have a tube that's, say, filled with hydrogen gas, and you essentially pass a bunch of current through it so that you dump a bunch of energy into that gas. And then out of that gas then comes light. And the light, if you pass it through a prism, remember, prisms can do this diffraction thing. And particularly in a prism, they diffract and then they spread out uh, light so that you actually see the different kind of components that make up that. So what was found, what was known for quite a long time, is if you do that with hydrogen, then you essentially get these uh, four main uh, wavelengths of light that are coming out. So it's only really like four different kinds of photons that are coming out. There's there are these different wavelengths, kind of hard to read on the screen right here, but one's like 413 nanometers, one's 430 something nanometers, one way up here is at 600 and something else nanometers. And so those are, you know, it, there's some blue, one bluish, one violetish, one reddish, somewhere in the middle of cyan of some kind. But that was it, right? At least right, right here, that, that's all of this, the wavelengths that you'd see coming off of this hydrogen. So this is what you would call the atomic spectra of hydrogen. And you could do that for other things. Um, I believe that one is neon, and neon has a lot more wavelengths that it puts out. Iron, iron again has even more wavelengths that it'll put out, but each of these are unique uh, sets of wavelengths that the elements will put out. And yeah. So there are only certain wavelengths, and those wavelengths depend on the kind of gas that it is. So they depend on the element you're actually looking at the light. 
Okay, so one of the ways, or one of the, I guess, sort of earlier and still rather successful ways of describing this spectrum, this atomic spectrum, or spectra, uh, was known as the Bohr model, because it was thought of by Niels Bohr, the guy I mentioned last time too. And essentially what he said, or his idea, his theory, was that electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus of an atom, so remember an atom is going to be made up of a nucleus, and the nucleus has protons and neutrons inside, and there's electrons that are somewhere orbiting around uh, the nucleus. So it's sort of like this very simple diagram, this very simple picture up here. And essentially what he said is that the electrons can only occupy what we would call stationary states. So there's only certain um, sort of orbits or distances that electrons can be at around the nucleus. And they can't exist in between those. So when an electron moves from one state to another, say from this outer state down to this inner state, or this inner uh, orbit, stationary orbit, then it's going to uh, give off the, a certain photon associated with the jump between those two. And while well, the picture in the bottom left here is showing the spectrum of hydrogen, and it's showing it as basically it amounts to the fact, or it comes from electrons jumping from uh, further and further orbits down to this sort of closest orbit to the nucleus. So in a sense, this is a very uh, classical-ish model where it just thinks about the atom as being sort of like a solar system and electrons are like planets orbiting around the sun in our solar system. And when an a atom is going to emit light, basically that's like a, a planet that jumps from one orbit down to another one. And the larger that jump is, the more energy is given off. So a larger jump, more energy is a higher frequency photon given off. So, yeah. So in, as again as shown in here, uh, that closest you would uh, label some of these states with numbers like n, n goes say one, two, three, four, five, six. And if you have, say, an electron in the third orbit and it drops down to the second orbit, it's not a very big drop, it's not a very high energy. So longer wavelength, that's about the 600 nanometer photon that's going to be given off. Versus jump from the sixth orbit all the way down to that second one. But it's a much larger jump, much higher energy, much shorter wavelength. That's going to correspond to that furthest over one, that 412 or 13 nanometer. So yeah, so Bohr's model is essentially there's like fixed spaces, rings, these orbits around the nucleus and electrons can only jump in between those things. And that's why the spacing of those things essentially is saying will determine the energy and the wavelength of the photon that is given off when an electron jumps from one to the other. So this is why atoms and elements, they all have different uh, spacings in their orbits essentially, and that dictates, that, or that is essentially why the atomic spectra for these atoms are different. All right, so Bohr's model gives us a pretty good idea of why, or somewhat of an idea of why the atomic spectra are the way they are, why there's only certain wavelengths of light that come out, and because those have to do with the fact that there's only certain orbits that are available for electrons to be in, in any given atom. Well, to get a better understanding, or go kind of even deeper, we then have to take the concept again of electrons uh, acting as waves. So again, uh, all things at the subatomic level can act as particles, they can act as waves. Okay. So if we imagine that electrons are acting as waves, then we can get an even better idea of why this is the case. And really it comes down to the same sort of idea of why you can only have certain 
frequencies or tones or sounds that like say a guitar will make. So if you take like a string on a guitar, it's only it's a certain length. And if you pluck it, one of the things it can do is the whole string can sort of move up and down. Right? That would be like this first sort of standing wave being pictured right at the top here. Right? So you have the whole wave just kind of going boom, 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 boom. Right? That's one frequency that that string can do. It could also do any sort of multiple of that wavelength. So if you double that wavelength, then you can actually have this sort of frequency going on where the standing wave is such that there's actually two bumps. Like, right? It comes up and down. And down and up. Right? So it's constantly going, bumping up and down in two places. Right? Or you could have three times that original wavelength and you get this uh, third sort of harmonic. Or you could have four times, you get this fourth harmonic. Right? Those are all allowed because essentially each of them is able to be tied down at either end. Because that's sort of just what restricts the uh, string on the guitar. It's just held at either end. Then you could imagine that there's actually wavelengths that aren't allowed on a guitar. One of them might be like this one, where it's sort of like that first wavelength that we saw here, that first uh, the frequency it could make, but the wavelength's a little bit longer. And just to be clear, these, these are actually half wavelengths that are showing to begin with. The full wavelength would be up and all the way back down. But that's okay. So this is sort of a possible oscillation you can imagine, a possible way that string could move, except for it's forbidden because it doesn't actually uh, stop or have this sort of stationary point right where the string ends. So you can't have that. It won't, your guitar just can't do that. Similarly, you could imagine uh, taking one of those wavelengths and shortening it, and then again, we have what you would say maybe is a forbidden wavelength there, forbidden frequency, because it doesn't uh, follow the physical constraint that the string needs to be tied down and not move at these two points, at the two ends. All these other ones are examples of frequencies that can happen. They're all, they all stop at these particular points, so they don't move at those points. These ones do, uh, don't. So for a guitar, there's allowed frequencies, there's these allowed standing waves, uh, and there's also these forbidden ones, and there's all kinds of examples, more examples of both. These are just some. Okay, so the same idea then start, we could think holds for electrons. Okay. So if electrons are waves, then you can imagine that, uh, you know, it has a certain wavelength, and the restriction for it to be um, around an atom for it to exist in an orbit around an atom is that that wavelength essentially has to meet up on itself. If you took that wavelength and you wrapped it around, you need the two ends of the wave to always meet up. So, I guess maybe in this bottom left picture is an example where you could imagine taking, a, say, a wave that's gone through I think it looks like five oscillations. It's gone through five sort of wavelengths. But if you bend it all the way back around on itself, it both meet up at this sort of peak of the wave. So in a sense, they're still meeting up, even though they're, you're kind of taking this wave and you're bending it around back on itself, but it's meeting up at the same uh, uh, point, essentially, as it um, started on, right? Where it started, it's kind of finishing there, so you can pull it back around. This other picture, is, well, so that would be an allowed standing wave here. Uh, this other picture is a forbidden one where it's not necessarily an equal number of wavelengths, um, but regardless, when you take that wave and you try to wrap it back around on this circle, on this, on this distance here, you wrap it back around, the waves are doing different things when they meet back up, right? Like one's going up, one's going down. So, and the, then finally in the picture in the far bottom left here, you can imagine, all right, well, we could get particular orbits 
and they're constrained because you have, say, one, the distance for one electron wavelength, right? That's the shortest distance we can get. And you take that distance and you wrap it around, essentially, the nucleus, and that's the size of the orbit. You take uh, two, you allow the, it's actually think about allowing the wave, the electron to go through sort of two wavelengths, right? Then you have the double, second one down here. You could wrap that one around the nucleus, and now you have this second sort of orbit state, right? Or it could be three wavelengths that the electron goes through, and you could wrap that around the nucleus. So this idea of electrons acting as waves really starts to give you more of a um, fundamental understanding of why there are only certain orbits around the nucleus where electron can be. Because in between there, the electron wave would not meet back up on itself and that's again, it's sort of like the trying to get the guitar to do a frequency that's just not allowed. Okay. So, as I've tried to emphasize, this, these ideas can give us an understanding of why the atomic spectra is the way that it is, or why you might, uh, why atoms and elements will emit certain photons of light and not emit other ones. It turns out that if you think about that process in the opposite direction, where it's instead of an electron jumping from an outer orbit to an inner orbit, giving off a photon, you could have a photon come in and sort of knock an electron up from a lower orbit to a higher orbit. That is a process of absorption. But they're essentially just inverse processes. They amount, or they're fundamentally worked in the same way. And the fact that we now can say that there are only particular orbits, and those orbits are restricted by the fact that the electron wave needs to wrap around on itself and meet up uh, properly on itself, um, tells us why there's only those specific wavelengths of photons that are given off. Um, and also, like I was saying, for absorption, it's why uh, elements will only absorb certain photon wavelengths too. Because you, you need to essentially boost the electron up to another multiple wavelength. So just some terminology too, when the when a photon is absorbed by an atom, you like I've been saying, you're kind of knocking the electron into a higher orbit. Uh, the technical term would be you're exciting the electron. And then once the electron at some point later is going to want to fall back into that lower orbit, do that quantum jump where in, back into the lower orbit, you'd say that's a de-excitation of the electron, and that's when the photon of a photon of that same wavelength will be given off. It doesn't have to be the exact same process. So say, like in this picture, you might be boosting an electron or exciting an electron from the second orbit to the third orbit, right? It, when it absorbs that photon in the far left, it could uh, fall back down into the second orbit and give off the same wavelength photon. It could also fall back or fall all the way into the first orbit, which would be a bigger jump. So you'd be giving off more energy in that photon. You'd have a higher frequency photon giving off. So the picture on the left here is sort of another way to imagine those orbits. And it's sort of like jumping uh, up and down stairs. So if I jump down uh, one stair at a time, I'm essentially moving with the same, or I'm jumping the same amount of energy at a time, and so each of those jumps would give off the same frequency of light. However, I could also jump over one step, I do like two steps at a time, that's more energy in one jump, so you give off a higher frequency photon, and again, higher frequency, shorter wavelength. Okay, so uh, Bohr gave us this idea of this sort of or the kind of solar system picture of the atom where you have these orbits and there's only particular stationary sort of orbits that electrons can exist in. 
we take that and add the fact that an electron can act like a wave, then we sort of understand why those particular orbits are like that. You need multiple, you need those electron waves to wrap back around and meet up. So that was good, and it gives us good understanding. Um, however, if you really want to get to the actual, or much closer to the actual uh, properties and how atoms actually act and what they look like, and particularly if you want to get a three-dimensional picture as well, then we need to use uh, that Schrodinger equation that I was talking about. And the Schrodinger equation, basically, it's like Bohr and uh, de Broglie kind of were taking in these lessons of uh, the photon or understanding those uh, ideas of quantum mechanics. The Schrodinger equation really sort of takes those to heart much more and utilizes that equation and the idea of a wave function to actually give you a full three-dimensional picture of an atom and the electrons acting as waves and instead of just getting these sort of stationary orbits like planetary orbits we it then ends up giving you these sort of three-dimensional pictures which we call orbitals so the yeah I think I have another slide on orbitals so oh yeah the only other thing to say then is instead of being just these understanding them the before like we had orbits that these electrons could be in when we move also to orbitals we've taken this idea that probability is a fundamental aspect of the universe and the orbitals aren't exactly telling you where the electron is it's sort of giving you a spread or giving you a, a place where you could find those electrons and we would call those, that's why they're sometimes called probability clouds. It's like a, it's a probabilistic region where it's like, oh, you might have this 50% chance you're going to spot the electron in that region. Right, um, so the orbitals, uh, well, before I say anything else, there's a picture of just some basic orbitals and they're labeled in a number of different ways, but partly uh, by this sort of lettering scheme, S, P, D, and I think F and G, and there's, then they go alphabetical. I don't know why. There's, there's some historical reason why it's a weird uh, ordering of letters like that. But anyway, the, um, in the picture on the left here that's showing the, some different examples of orbitals, the simplest one is basically a sphere. It's a sphere, and that it's saying essentially that where the electron is going to be around the nucleus is uh, sort of spherical. It, the probability you'll find it on one side versus the other side is basically the same as long as you're the same distance away from the nucleus. And it's also spherical in the sense that you move away in a, a spherical sort of like bubble. The probability that you're going to find the electron further and further out gets less and less and less. So these orbitals are, they give us a three-dimensional picture, but again, it's not a, a literal picture to say that this is what the electron looks like or this is what the atom looks like. It's giving you a probability cloud, sort of, of saying where you're probably going to find the electron. So the simplest one, again, is like a sphere, basically. The next simplest one is basically a sphere within another shell. So instead of just having a one orbit, or orbital, you have one orbital and then you have a second orbital around that one. And these are regions where you could find the electrons sitting in. Another example of one is this sort of dumbbell shape, right, the P2 one. And that's essentially where you have these sort of like two dumbbells on either side of the nucleus and you can find the electron in either of those sort of uh, orbitals. And they just get kind of more and more complex, like the one that uh, 3D or D3 one is you have these dumbbells, but then you also have this uh, ring around um, in the middle there. Right. So those are examples of some orbitals, and it turns out that understanding the orbitals is basically 
what amounts to understanding the physical structure of an element, like what physical form it takes, the geometry of it. And these SPD labels are, um, are used in chemistry. I mean, they're also used in physics, but in chemistry, if you've ever taken a chemistry course, you'll have at some point probably run into having to talk about the particular uh, form of uh, that element, and it has these SPD sort of labels there. It also turns out that now understanding what the physical structure of them looks like allows us to better understand how uh, uh, chemical bondings will happen and why chemical bondings will happen. So on the left here, we just essentially, because well, essentially the chemical bondings are just overlapping orbitals. So if you take two orbital pictures and you start to push them together and overlap like these, uh, the first one is just these two very simple spherical orbitals, you start to push them together and you get a picture of a molecule, right? Two atoms bonded together, where it's now this sort of like figure eight almost uh, shape. And you can get more and more complex uh, bindings given more and more complex initial orbital states. All right. So, I just, I feel like I should say this at some point, these are, ideas are probably fairly complex and I'm not expecting that you're going to be an expert on any of these things, so don't be worried too much if a lot of this maybe is going over your head or it just, you don't feel like it's hitting very hard, um, that's okay. At this point of the course, we're dealing with um, a lot of things that are difficult to get across on a conceptual level. And so really, I'm just trying to give you an idea, again, of what they are and trying very basic sort of stuff. Um, yeah. OK. So all that said, something that kind of comes up, or you might start to think about at some point, is, OK, we now have this idea of the quantum world, the subatomic world, and things are very different on the subatomic world than they are on our scale, may call it like the macro scale, or the classical uh, scale. And there's a, there could be an issue if there's no place, there's no way that those two uh, regions sort of meet up. The reason sort of being is that, you know, we have a lot of things on our scale that we understand very well, right? how um, all, basically all the stuff that we did for the first three quarters of this course was macro scale, like classical sort of physics, and all that works really well for our scale. So there could be an issue if our, that, our understanding of that scale doesn't ever meet up with the quantum scale, or the quantum world, or how we understand quantum physics. So it would, I think it was actually Bohr, again, Bohr did a lot of stuff in uh, development of quantum physics, but uh, who really pushed this idea of the correspondence principle, meaning that whenever you kind of try to push these two theories into regions where they overlap or where they're going to meet up, then they better agree. Because if not, you just have a complete disconnect between these two worlds, and you might as well be talking about something else entirely. So you could state it in a lot of different ways, but I think one of the ways he stated it was, for a new theory to be valid, it must account for verified results of the old theory. It's another way of saying the same sort of thing. Quantum physics, it's great to explain some of these crazy things that we're seeing at the very small scale, and very weird sort of phenomenon, but at some point, it also needs to be able to explain uh, things that we already understand very well, right? Why, why does an apple drop when I let it go? Yeah. So one of the biggest or most uh, straightforward examples of where this needs to be the case or where this needs to happen is, like I've been saying, is the transition from very, very small things to very, very large things, right? And again, there are other sort of ways of, under, of getting to a quantum sort of system than just being very, very small, but that's sort of the easiest one to picture. So quantum physics, again, is a probabilistic theory. 
just tells you how likely something is to happen. Right? What kind of things are possible and how likely those things are to happen. And where you actually get it meeting up with larger scale things or macro scale things, the reason that they're able to correspond, the reason that they can meet up is because essentially the probability that quantum mechanics is going to, or quantum physics is going to give to you basically tells you that only one thing is really possible at that point. Right? Like if I drop an apple, there actually is a possibility, or if I release an apple, there is actually some possibility that it doesn't fall down, it actually moves upward. It just turns out that that possibility is unbelievably small because of how big the object is. Right? And it might not seem big, but when we're talking about the difference between our scale and, quantum, and the quantum scale, the subatomic scale, it's unbelievably big. So when you get to the scale of very, very large things, the only possible outcome is the classical sort of outcome, the outcome we already knew about. All right, so a great way to understand how this switch from this probabilistic things, you know, all kinds of possibilities can happen to this, well, only one possible thing is really going to happen. Um, how you can understand how that kind of switch might happen or where that transition might happen. We can think just about uh, flipping coins. So, right, so if you flip a coin, you could ask, well, how likely is it that I get heads? Or how likely is it that I get tails? And if you start with one coin, flip one coin, how likely do I get tails? It's pretty likely, right? It's actually 50%, you have 50% chance. But if you then say, okay, take two coins, flip two coins, how likely is it that I get two heads? Less likely, turns out it's only about 25%. Or it's 25%. Right? So less likely. If you flip a uh, hundred coins, right? how likely is it that you're going to get all heads? Well, at that point, it becomes pretty darn unlikely. Right? It's still possible. Um, and if you do that, flip a hundred coins a whole bunch of times, then maybe you will get all heads eventually. But if you take a billion coins or a trillion coins, or just outrageous numbers of coins, flip them and ask how many, what's the probability I'm going to get all of them to be tails? It's basically impossible. It's practically impossible. It's not going to happen. You can flip a billion coins as many times as you want, you're never really, you're never going to get all tails. Even though it's still technically possible, there is a possibility that it will happen, it's practically impossible. So, this is the idea where essentially you're going from this very, very small scale where a lot of things might be possible to you build up a bunch of those small scale things and you have so many of them all kind of those probabilities working together where you get to this large enough scale where essentially only one thing is ever really possible, right? Like I let go of the apple, it falls down. It doesn't fall up, it doesn't fall to the side, it doesn't fall towards me, it falls down. All right, so now we're going to switch gears just a little bit and uh, go, go towards uh, nuclear physics. So, right, uh, in the late uh, 19th century, uh, almost 20th century, um, this guy, Bequerel, Bequerel, again, I'm bad with pronouncing names, so sorry. Uh, but basically, he discovered that there were these invisible rays, uh, and they were emanating or coming from uranium salts. And he found that they could penetrate through different materials, but was able to determine that they weren't light rays. It wasn't any form of light. Okay. And later, or kind of spurred by that, um, a number of people, but uh, particularly the Curies, uh, Pierre and uh, Marie Curie uh, did more experiments and did some more searching for other materials that would emanate or give off these same sorts of rays. And they actually found some. Uh, the Curies did the, this polonium, radium, um, and they emitted these similar kind of rays. So they weren't really sure what they were. They knew they weren't light, and they knew they could kind of go through materials and hit other materials afterwards. 
So as it turns out, there are a number of different kinds of things that were happening in those processes. They're all uh, talked about or labeled, put underneath the category of radioactivity. And essentially, radioactivity is just uh, things coming off of uh, material, like uranium salts, or any kind of, many different kinds of elements and such. But they're coming off due to something happening within the atoms themselves. It's not that uh, atom reformed with a different atom to make another molecule. It's not some chemical process. It's inside the atom, something's happening. And that's why we're getting these uh, strange sort of rays, these things emanating off of them. So it turns out there's kind of three main types of radiation. And they're essentially named in order. I think these are Greek, the Greek letter order where alpha was the first kind of uh, radiation that was discovered, that was from the uranium. And then you have uh, beta and gamma. But uh, alpha radiation um, is, well, as is shown in the picture here, we have this big nucleus and kind of showing a picture of all the different kinds of radiation that could come off of this nucleus. Right? If you have the nucleus is uh, radioactive, then maybe you could have uh, a chunk of that nucleus come off, and that chunk is a proton, two protons and two neutrons getting knocked off somehow or jumping off somehow. That's an alpha particle. And that's actually the same thing as the nuclei, or the nucleus of a helium atom. Helium is two protons, and you generally two neutrons. So it turns out alpha particles, or alpha radiation, is just helium nuclei. Um, beta radiation was the next one discovered. And that again turned out to be something uh, we already sort of had an idea about, and that is just electrons, generally fast moving electrons. But beta radiation is just another way of saying these are electrons being emitted by radioactivity. And finally, we have gamma radiation. Uh, gamma radiation is a broad term for any kind of electromagnetic radiation, so photons being given off. So if you have a radioactive nucleus, it can give off all these different kinds of things due to some processes happening within the nucleus there. And just to give you some more information or something else to think about, if you have a radioactive source, um, those different kinds of radiation will penetrate through different materials, uh, more, some more, some less than others. And this is just an example um, of a couple of things. So the Alpha radiation or those helium nuclei won't even really go through, say, a piece of paper. They get stopped by a piece of paper. Versus the beta radiation, those electrons will travel through a paper, but they'll get stopped by aluminum or a metal generally. Um, and then finally, the gamma radiation will go through the paper and the aluminum, but will get stopped up by lead. Okay, so what's happening with this radioactivity? Well, the, basically the most common type of radioactivity is due to uh, radioactive decay. And decay is another, is a term that basically means an atomic, the nucleus of an, of an atom uh, is unstable in some way and it will spontaneously start, start to break apart. So you could have Say like in the in the last slide, well we we have kind of a similar picture here, where you have on the bottom left here we have a diagram. You start out with a nucleus on the left. That nucleus is unstable and so it wants to break apart. And there's sort of these three routes that that nucleus could go into. So if it goes through alpha decay or alpha radiation or it gives off that alpha radiation, it's this top one, and you have the original nucleus but it gives off that uh, helium nucleus, right? That chunk of two protons, two neutrons. There you go. That's one kind of uh, radioactive decay. The other one where um, uh, beta decay, it doesn't give off uh, a proton or a neutron, but actually one of the neutrons is going to transform into a proton inside the nucleus, and you actually give off an electron as well. I believe you give off something else there too we haven't talked about. And finally, 
you might have something where it's just gamma radiation, but again, it's something usually where uh, probably a neutron is transforming into a proton. So all of these are things where, think, where stuff inside the nucleus of the atom is sort of breaking down in one way or another. Maybe a part of it splits off, maybe one part of it just kind of decays into another thing, becomes something else. Um, oh yeah, and so a nice example of decay, uh, say beta decay, beta decay, right? We're giving off an electron, electrons that beta radiation, is the uh, beta decay of carbon-14. So carbon-14, you start out with six protons and eight neutrons in the nucleus. Right? Six protons means it's carbon, eight neutrons means it's an isotope of carbon. And if that beta decays, it generally will decay into nitrogen-14. And that will happen because one of those neutrons will decay and become a proton. So now you have seven protons, seven neutrons. So seven protons, it's nitrogen. Seven neutrons, it's like the standard sort of nitrogen. And along with that, during that process, you get an electron that gets shot out of the nucleus. And there's your beta decay, or there's your beta radiation. So this is a example of beta decay. Um, and as it turns out, uh, there's a good amount of natural radioactivity. Most of the radioactivity that you encounter in your lifetime is going to be naturally occurring radioactivity, and that's from things, uh, radioactive elements in the atmosphere, it's from radioactivity happening within the Earth, um, and even within, you know, stuff that you eat. Right, so we have elements, and some of them are unstable, like radium, uh, uranium, carbon-14. Uh, they're unstable, so they'll decay, and they'll, the nucleus will change, it'll become a different element. Um, so when exactly any uh, decay is gonna happen, like say you somehow you're holding a carbon-14 atom, and you know it's going to decay at some point. Again, quantum physics, this is a quantum uh, object, a very, very small sort of thing. Uh, it basically says that you can't ever know exactly when it's going to decay. It's a probabilistic thing. So it's, you could say it's, it's likely to decay within this time frame, or, um, or a more sort of macro scale look, a larger scale look at it, is if you have a whole bunch of the stuff, like not just one carbon-14 atom, but say you have several billion carbon-14 atoms and you have like a gram of it, right? Or you have trillions and trillions and trillions and you have more of it, right? So when you have that many together, it's still probabilistic of when anyone's going to decay, but on the whole, we could say um, that over this amount of time, about half of them, or half of them, will have decayed. So this is where the idea of uh, half-life comes from, which is essentially a measure of how quickly, or the rate at which a radioactive uh, material will decay. So for uh, the half-life is essentially just a time, it's an amount of time, and if you start out with a certain amount of substance, of a substance, say you have one kilogram of radium, then after one half-life, and the half-life is particular to that particular element, so radium's half-life is uh, 1,620 years, 1,620 years, after one half-life, you'll now have half of that radium you started with. And after another half-life, you're gonna have half of that amount, so now a quarter of the original. So this graph is just showing if we started out all the way at the left, so zero, zero years from the start, right? This is where we're starting our clock here. We start out with a kilogram of radium. Since its half-life is 1,620 years, you go 1,620 years later, we're down to uh, half a kilogram. You go another half-life up to three, 3,240 years, we're half of that amount now, right? So half of half a kilogram is a quarter of a kilogram. Go another half-life length of that, 
a half life, and you get half of that amount, right? So half of a fourth is an eighth. So each time you're cutting the amount down, every time you go through a half life, you're cutting down whatever amount was there in half. So be clear, that doesn't mean, as is shown in the graph here, that once I go through two half lives, it's all gone. Right? That might you might be thinking that well, you start with a hole, you take half away, you got half. You're going to take another half away the next time, and now you got nothing. Right? That's not how half life works. It's every single time, at every single point, you're taking half of whatever is there. Right? So if I'm at a kilogram, go through one half life period, I'm going down to half a kilogram. Right? Now I'm at half a kilogram. If I go through another half life, it's half of that amount. So half of one half of a kilogram, quarter of a kilogram. Yeah. Okay. So a uh, little question about half lives, and something that's going to help us maybe a little bit later is say you start with carbon fourteen some amount of carbon-14, and the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. No, I don't, yeah. So how long will it take for whatever amount of carbon-14 you have to reduce to 1 16th of that amount? So. Take a, take a second, pause, think about it. Hopefully you give yourself an answer and figure it out in a second. All right, well, turns out it's deep. It's almost 23,000 years. You get to 1 16th of the original amount. And again, it doesn't matter how much you start with. You could have started with a kilogram. You could have started with a gram. You could have started with thousand kilograms uh, if it's since it's decaying radioactively it has its half-life and every half-life every amount of time that whatever that half-life is you're cutting it that amount down by half again right so it doesn't matter what you started with after one half-life you got half after another half-life you got a quarter after another half-life you got an eighth and finally after another half-life you get a sixteenth right so you'll need to wait for four half-lives to have elapsed, for four time periods equal to the half-life of carbon-14 to elapse. And that turned out to be four times the half-life is 22,920 years. Quite a while. OK. So keep keeping with this carbon-14 and uh, also Given gives us a, I guess, a useful application of some of these of this idea of radioactivity and uh, uh, decay and half life is uh, what's known as radiocarbon dating. Right? And in general, it doesn't have to just be with carbon; it could be with any radioactive element that has a long half life. You can do this sort of radio. I think the general term is radiometric dating. Um, but as it turns out living organisms uh, take in carbon, right? whatever carbon's in the atmosphere. And that carbon is some ratio or some relative amount of carbon-12, the standard sort of carbon, 12 protons, 12, or sorry, 6 protons, 6 neutrons, carbon-12, or uh, it's going to be this carbon-14, 6 protons still, it's got to still be carbon, but now 8 neutrons, right? So isotope of carbon. Carbon-12 is stable. It doesn't uh, decay radioactively, right? So you know, it doesn't have any half-life. It's not going to disappear, right? Whereas carbon-14, as I've been pointing out, is unstable, and so it will decay. It actually becomes nitrogen. Um, yeah. So while uh, animals or while organisms in general are living and they're uh, respirating and they're taking in uh, carbon, then the carbon-14 that's in their body is slowly going to decay, but you're still taking in more carbon, so you kind of replenish that carbon-14 when the organism is alive. However, when it dies, the carbon-14 is continuing to decay, but the organism is no longer replenishing with new carbon-14. Right? 
So it has, essentially when an organism dies, it has a certain ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14. I don't know, remember, or have it off the top of my head what the exact ratio is, but there's a certain amount of carbon-12, a certain amount of carbon-14, and since the carbon-12 is stable, it doesn't go away, but the carbon-14 slowly does. Right? So that amount of carbon-14 is slowly going away relative to the carbon-12. Which means that if you examine the organic elements, uh, you can actually date organic materials based on how much carbon-12 is relative to how much carbon-14 there is. So the picture on the bottom here is essentially just showing if you started, uh, well, four half-lives ago, 22,920 years ago, carbon-14 will have gone through four half-lives and there'll be a sixteenth of whatever carbon-14 was left initially. So it's nice with a, when a element or radioactive element has a long half-life like that, it makes it uh, nicer because there's enough around for long enough that you can date back to fairly uh, you know, fairly far back. Um, it turns out that this is not just the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 is not the only thing that gets used in radiocarbon dating, but that's kind of the easiest sort of thing to explain and understand, so I'll give you that one. So radioactivity and radioactive decay, those are examples of what we would call nuclear processes. So this is kind of the segue into, more broadly speaking, uh, nuclear physics. And essentially what makes a process nuclear is that changes happen within the atom, and generally within the nucleus of the atom. So these are changes that happen on a subatomic scale. So there are subatomic, I guess I've used that term a lot, but it basically just meant to say that there's a scale of the atom, which is already very, 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 very small, and changes where you have atoms rearranging and whatnot, that's mostly chemistry. But if you go within the atom, then we're talking about subatomic, and that's where we're getting into that nuclear scale in nuclear physics. So there's two sort of main types of nuclear processes, sometimes said called nuclear reactions. Uh, one type is fusion, and fusion is essentially a combination, a combining of subatomic entities, subatomic particles, or you could also think about it as fusing them together. Um, the other main type is fission, and fission is a type of nuclear process that breaks things apart. Um, radioactivity is actually a, kind of a subclass of uh, fission, because radioactivity is things kind of falling apart in the, nu in the nucleus. And as you might already know, both of these processes uh, will release energy, and actually an incredible amount of energy. And that energy mainly comes in the form of gamma rays, meaning very high frequency uh, electromagnetic radiation, very high frequency photons. It also comes in the form of the kinetic energy of those uh, subatomic particles that are getting knocked out of the nucleus very fast moving subatomic particles, so they're carrying a bunch of energy in that motion itself, the kinetic energy. All right, so first let's talk about nuclear fusion, right? So fusing things together, I mean combining uh, nuclei generally, uh, protons and neutrons smashing together. It could be other subatomic particles, but oftentimes it's uh, atomic nuclei. So this process of smashing or combining nuclei together, again, will produce a lot of energy and it also generally produce other subatomic particles as well. So one example of this process, or this kind of process, is if you take two isotopes of hydrogen, so in this bottom left uh, diagram, on the left side of it, we have deuterium, which is essentially hydrogen with one neutron, so there's a proton and there's a neutron, deuterium, and you have tritium, which is again one proton, so still hydrogen, but now with two neutrons, those are isotopes of hydrogen. If you smash those together, or just shoot them at each other fast enough somehow, then you can cause this fusion to happen where you fuse some of them together, and you actually create a helium nucleus, right, where you now have two protons and two neutrons, you also 
break off one of those extra neutrons and it will kick off and become uh, some kind of radio radiation. And you have this energy coming out. And again, in this picture, the energy, I believe, is just is generally gamma radiation, gamma rays. So that's one example of a nuclear uh, fusion process. However, that's, that example is part of this nuclear uh, fusion uh, sequence essentially, that takes place inside of the sun. It's the sun, the thing that's powering the sun is nuclear fusion, and that's meaning that the inside of the core of the sun, the atoms and the uh, nuclei that are there are moving so quickly, they're moving so fast, when they smash together, they get close enough that they can fuse together when you get nuclear fusion. So I showed you this picture, I showed this picture to you all uh, quite a while ago in this course as sort of a preview of uh, nuclear processes, um, but kind of coming back to it now, where you can maybe more understand a little bit more about it, in that in this sort of chain of, re of reactions, you start out essentially with hydrogen nuclei, being just a proton, so the little red guys are protons, and if you have two protons, you smash them together, then you can actually fuse them and form uh, hydrogen 2, deuterium, so you have, a, you have a proton and a neutron, and in that process you get out, um, it looks like a positron, which is a positively charged electron, and this thing called a neutrino, which we don't really have time to talk much about. So then you get that deuterium, and if, now there's still more hydrogen flying around there, more hydrogen nuclei, just pos uh, protons flying around, you smash that together with another proton, then you fuse those together, you cause another fusion reaction, you get uh, helium, but helium-3, so two protons and one neutron, it's not stable. Out of that process, you will have gotten this energy as gamma radiation. But if you have now these two helium-3 nuclei, each of them are unstable, so they'll only be around for a little while, they're going to decay in a little while, and if they sit around for too long. But if they smash together, then we finally get a stable helium atom, along with well, two more protons, two more helium nuclei, or hydrogen nuclei. Right? So this whole process is, ha is playing out in the sun, and each one of these steps, we're getting this energy coming out, right? Energy in the form of the kinetic energy of the positron and the nu uh, neutrino, energy in the form of the gamma radiation, energy in the form of, well, the protons just being kicked out again as hydrogen nuclei and zooming off again. All of this energy is coming out of this pro each of these steps in this process, and that's what's powering the sun, essentially. So fusion is essential, an essential process for life to exist on Earth. Most life. I guess under this, there's uh, deep sea vents and whatnot where there's life around there that doesn't really rely on the sun. But for us and for most life on Earth, we need this process. And I guess the, now that I've said that, the, uh, those vents in the deep ocean actually also rely on nuclear processes too. So yeah, we don't really have time to talk about that. Okay, so the other process is nuclear uh, fission. So instead of fusing things together, you're fissioning them, which means you're sort of breaking them apart. Now, the, the term never made that much sense to me, except if you think about it relative to fusion is fusing things, fission is the other one. Fission is breaking things apart. Okay. So it's, um, Again, radioact uh, radioactive decay is a form of nuclear uh, fission because it's uh, nuclei that are just falling apart in some way. Some way. Um, so a more common type, or another type of uh, uh, fission is uh, what would be called like a nuclear, a fission nuclear reaction where you actually have, instead of a nucleus just decaying spontaneously, you have a nucleus and then you slam something else into it, but instead of fusing to that nucleus, it actually just breaks that nucleus apart. So in the bottom here are pictures of sort of the two, I think, most common kinds of uh, uh, fission that happen in nuclear reactors. So a lot of nuclear reactors utilize uh, uranium, 
and particularly uranium-235 as the fuel for that reaction, for those reactors. And they utilize fission because they essentially energize or somehow uh, speed up neutrons and shoot neutrons into like a big a mass of uh, that uranium. And so the neutrons will eventually hit one of those uh, uranium nuclei, right? So the neutron comes in, hits that big uranium nuclei, breaks it apart, and so you get these other uh, elements, other nuclei, um, as a product of that, and then you also get more neutrons coming out, and usually uh, gamma radiation. Right? So those, those blasts or bursts are just meant to be uh, gamma rays. But yeah, two things colliding, breaking apart. Okay, so almost to the end here. Um, it turns out that those processes and understanding um, this quantum world uh, sort of leads us or led us to formulate and kind of discover uh, new forces that were at play in our world. And so on our scale, and the things we talked about so far in this course, are basically gravity and electromagnetism, right? So the gravitational force, the electromagnetic force. And on a large scale, even, you know, down to uh, like the size of viruses and uh, cells and things like that, pretty small scale, these are essentially the only forces that are at play. Yeah. And well, for largely because those two forces are what we would call long-range forces. Meaning, if you have, say, like a source for an electromagnetic force, maybe a magnet, that force can be felt a long distance away from that magnet. And a long distance, when you're talking about uh, sort of macro scale versus like the quantum scale, the subatomic scale, a large distance is, you know, an inch is an incredibly large distance already. So trying to keep in mind that when I say like long range versus short range, we're talking about incredibly short distances versus like just, just like, I don't know, very short. So very short versus like unbelievably short. Mm -hmm. So once you get all to that area of already very short, we're talking about the size of like cells and uh, viruses and bacteria, right? We're already on like the larger sort of uh, scale. So uh, electromagnetism and gravity are long-range forces, and the, the effect of them is felt far away. It turns out that these other forces that uh, we've sort of been led to and discovered are what you would call short-range forces, meaning that they, the effect of those forces is only felt when you're very, very close to the source of that. So that would be like... Um, well, on our scale, it seems like a magnet might be a short-range force. Right? Because if you have two magnets, you think about them, you're holding them out here, um, you bring them close together, and you don't really feel anything until they're pretty close together. Right? So we have to uh, extrapolate from that that like, when you're bringing them close together, say they're within an inch of each other, what we're talking about is still billions of times smaller than that. Right? So bringing them within an inch of each other, that's still fairly long range. And it turns out there's still, there's actually a force when there's this far apart too, it's just kind of weak so you don't really feel it that much. Um, alternatively, like gravity, we know acts at a very large scale, right? Like, um, you know, the moon's held to the earth, the earth is held to the sun, those different things. So, my bad, I kind of forgot where to start with that. But, so the short range that we're talking about is ridiculously short, un, almost unimaginably short. We're talking about within the atom, scales within the atom, so, uh, and then within the constituents of the things that make up the atom. So it turns out that that scale for these short range forces is somewhere around the range of 10 to the minus 15 meters. So. Uh, a thousand trillionth 
of a meter. Un unimaginably small. But with the advent of some new technology, experiments, uh, our understanding of quantum physics and also relativity, which we'll talk about next time, um, some very genius experiments, we were actually able to probe those sort of scales. We were actually able to do things where you could kind of fiddle with stuff at that small scale or be able to extrapolate from stuff at that small scale to get an idea that, yeah, there was something actually happening on those incredibly short scales. Okay. So we're going to end with just talking about what those new forces are. And again, I'm just giving you a very brief sort of overview of what they, of these forces. So one is called the strong force, and very clever term, very clever uh, naming. It's the strongest of the forces. So in the same sense, I think I've talked to you before about uh, how electromagnetism is much, much stronger of a force relatively speaking than gravity is. And you can understand that by the fact that it's really only the electromagnetic forces between, say, the bottom of my shoe and the floor, it's the electrons in my shoe and the electrons on the shore, they're pushing against each other, that stop the whole entire Earth from pulling me in. Right? Because the entire Earth has this gravitational pull trying to pull me in. It's only the electrons in my shoe, at the bottom of my shoe, basically, that are pushing against me to keep me up. And that's plenty. Right? So, in that sense, the electromagnetic force is much, much stronger than the gravitational force. The strong force, it turns out, is something like 100 times stronger even than the electromagnetic force. It's the strongest of the forces. But again, it's only felt on a very, very short uh, length scale. You're very, things are very, very close together. And closer than you can hold your fingers together, essentially. You can't smash your fingers close enough together in order to get the atoms close enough together to start feeling a strong force. Um, so, the strong force is responsible for essentially holding things together at that subatomic scale. Right? So the strong force holds together uh, the things that, that are composite at that level, meaning the things that are made up of even smaller things. So as it, uh, as it turns out, protons and neutrons Largely, we've talked about them as being kind of like uh, a unit, a fundamental thing, but, uh, well, they're actually made up of smaller things. Sorry. Those smaller things are called quarks. We're not really gonna talk about those, but just know that they are smaller and they're kind of what you build a proton out of. So the, there's a picture in the bottom left, which is essentially a picture of a proton that's made up of three quarks. Technically, they're called the up, two up quarks and a down quark. A lot of weird terminology, don't worry about it so much. But the proton is a composite thing, it's made up of smaller things, and it's the strong force that holds those things together to keep that being a proton. Similarly, the neutron is made up of uh, smaller things, and again, it's the strong force that's holding those things together to form that pro neutron. And even further, there's a bunch of other things that are still fairly fundamental in our world that are held together, they're like essentially bundles of quarks. Um, so there's things like uh, pions and kaons and all crazy manner of things. And those things are again made up of smaller stuff and those held together by the strong force, right? So that's one of the things the strong force does. The other thing that it does is essentially hold nuclei together. So not only is it holding the things that are inside the proton together to keep that being a proton, it's also going to hold a proton and a neutron together to uh, form a nucleus. Okay. So the picture here, we have that helium nucleus. Right? It's made up of four nucleons, two protons, two neutrons. We call it an alpha particle, just because of historical reasons I want to talk about earlier. Right? But the reason that those things are held together if you ever thought about it beforehand, it doesn't really make much sense in terms of like gravitational force and electromagnetic force, right? The things are so incredibly small that there's almost no mass there that the gravitational force between them is non-existent. So it's not gravity holding them together. And beyond that, it's there's two protons there. So there's two positively charged things there, right? So the electromagnetic force would actually want to repel them. 
right? You have a like charges, or two like charges, they want to push each other apart. Right? So it, if you thought about a nucleus beforehand in any detail, you would think that doesn't make any sense. Why are they even held together? Well, as it turns out, it is the strong force that is holding those things together. And again, it only works at those very, very small scales. So within, say, the nucleus of an atom itself. All right, so finally, we're going to talk about the last one of these, or the other short range force, which is called the weak force. And again, very clever naming scheme. It's called the weak force because it is relatively weak compared to most of the other fundamental forces. It turns out it's still much stronger than gravity. Gravity as a force is just incredibly weak. So, um, compared to, say, uh, the electromagnetic force or electromagnetism, I think I have the numbers correct here, the weak force is 100 billion times weaker than the electromagnetic force. And again, remember, the electromagnetic force is still weaker than uh, the strong force. So essentially, the order is strong force, electromagnetic force, uh, weak force, uh, gravity. Right? So gravity, it turns out, is still far weaker than the weak force, and I think I have this correct. The weak force is of roughly, oh, uh, sorry, 10 trillion trillion, so that's 10 with 25 zeros, times stronger than gravity. So again, it's weak relative to the strong nuclear force, but it's still much uh, stronger than gravity. So. What the weak force actually does is very difficult to explain conceptually. Um, it's difficult to explain in general, actually. But at this level, there's not really much I can say about it other than to give an example of what it does or a place where it is uh, sort of part or what it's part of. And yeah, maybe something else. So. An example of where the weak force is in play, or where the weak force is acting, is in beta decay. And I think in other decay processes, some other decay processes too, but beta decay specifically is uh, essentially handled by the weak force. If, when beta decay happens, it's because of the weak force. Um, and another thing I could say is that this neutrino, this subatomic particle, it's fundamental particle, it's not made up of any other things as far as we can tell. Um, that thing in itself is very closely linked to the weak force. It's sort of interwoven with the weak force. And so basically whenever you have a, a nuclear process or some kind of nuclear reaction and there are neutrinos involved, neutrinos coming out, neutrinos going in, that's pretty good uh, indication. There, that is a weak force interaction. There's a weak a weak interaction happening there. So yes, all right, so radioactive uh, beta decay, like that beta decay of carbon-14, is a weak process. So uh, the weak force is what causes this uh, beta decay to happen. So in, the weak, when, in that beta decay, we go from carbon-14 to uh, nitrogen, but we also get out this electron and an anti-neutrino. It's still a neutrino. It's, yeah, anti and regular neutrino, basically the same thing, as far as we're concerned. So yeah, so it's weak force is responsible for what, why beta decay happens, and whenever you see a neutrino, basically that's a weak interaction. There's a weak force going on there. Yeah. So that is all I have then for our quantum and nuclear physics lecture. Um, again, these are a lot of these, most of this is very uh, abstract sort of concepts, difficult to understand, to kind of take in uh, internally, really, uh, under, really internalize these ideas. So I'm not expecting you to be expert, be an expert on any of the stuff that I've told you about, right? This is to give you an overview and just like this course is in general for the most part, is to give you an understanding of what the different aspects of physics are. So now we're in the modern realm of physics, quantum physics, nuclear physics, and rate, uh, relativity next week. And 
some of the things are fairly simple. Half-Life, not that tricky of a thing to understand. Other things, rather complicated. Um, so yeah, so take what you can and hopefully uh, get something. Yeah. All right, well, have a good night. I'll see you next time.